the BDR role, you often get people that are out of college hires or interns, early in career professionals, and now you are teaching them two of the most coveted skills in the industry, tenacity and empathy. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you today. Very, very nice to see you. Thank you for joining me this morning. It is Monday and it is a fabulous start to the week. So, and you look oh, yeah. fabulous. So, fantastic. Oh, stop, stop. <laughs> I, I am so glad that we connected. Uh, we've been in touch, but, you know, we've never really sort of hunkered down and connected. And I think this was a great opportunity for me to mm -hmm. just catch up with you. And this is how I'm getting folks to come to my, the community, engage with me, talk to talk about customers. And I know you're passionate about uh, customers as well. All right. So let me do a proper introduction to our audience. Um, my guest today is Lorraine Joseph. Lorraine is the founder of the Tenacious Development Assignment. And she will tell us in a little bit what it's all about. Uh, she was raised in Zanesville, Ohio. Um, she's done a whole bunch of things uh, on her journey to tech um, fr right from the age of 11 years old. So as a penny stockbroker, um, theater, uh, pursued vocal studies abroad. I mean, the list goes on, Lorraine. So <laughs> I am curious. I am really curious to see, to hear um, how you ended up in tech. So let me stop talking. <laughs> and why don't you take it from here and tell our audience a little bit about your journey to the tech world? Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's been a long journey, a long road. Um, so yeah, I did start at 11 years old, but not as a penny stockbroker. My first job <laughs> was at 11. And I actually cold called through the old fashioned uh, yeah. white pages to sell magazine subscriptions. So um, that was my first job. But how I got from there to tech, um, you know, I did the traditional route. I did a lot of theater when I was in high school and junior high. I was involved with that. So after college, um, I was a chemistry and math major and for whatever reason thought I would be a doctor. And a, I think, you know, the universe was telling me that's not the road for you. And it was the right the right message from the universe. So I ended up after college um, uh, getting my first job actually as a lab tech out of college um, because I had replied back in a cold email to a U.S. Uh, to a state senator, rather, when I was getting congratulated for my achievements in school to say, hey, there were no jobs at the time. You know, you guys wanted us to go to college, spend all this money. And this was pre-email. So this was the old fashioned type it on your typewriter thing. Yeah. And that letter got a call from the from the senator's office. He wanted to meet with me. Wow. So the journey to connect with people and be cold and respond started a long time ago. From even when I was in college and pre-med, they wanted yeah. us at Ohio State to interview someone in our um, field that we wanted to go into. So I didn't choose anyone at that time. I wanted to meet with the dean of the Ohio State School of Medicine. And yeah. of course, I cold called him and his admin said, no, I couldn't get past. Fine. Be that way. So back yeah. in my dorm room, I found his home phone number in the white pages and yeah. called his home and connected with him that way. And he gave me the opportunity when, to meet with him. So that same admin that said no, he now gave me permission to call her back and schedule time yeah. to meet so that's, you know, it's been a journey. It's been a journey on how to connect with people, to, to be tenacious, to go after them. So yes, yeah. post-college, I got involved in the musical world. I Someone heard me singing and said, you know, have you thought of opera? And that led me to start performing as a chorus member with Opera Columbus. And then yeah. that took to meet other people, which led me to an apprenticeship where I tenaciously went after them. I had no music degree. Uh, that took me to Italy, Cortona, Italy. And so it's been a road with that hustle and bustle. Um, yeah. I ended up working as a penny stockbroker back in Columbus, Ohio, where I cold called people at work to sell them penny stocks. And that led to financial planning where someone heard of me. 
And then that road took me continuing with music that took me from Columbus to Cincinnati, Ohio, where I studied at the Conservatory of Music as a non-degree vocal student. That took me to New York because my theory professor knew someone at the Juilliard School of Music. And yeah. I auditioned for him. I went to New York. It was a blizzard was coming. And he's yeah. like, why aren't you in New York? So that took me to New York. That's all I needed to hear. And once in New York, uh, that's where the real hustling began, where I was cold calling um, entertainment people, where I was auditioning when I can, where I was working one temp job after another, and where I started writing my own TV show. And that was three YouTube days we had public access. So I got my show on New York and L.A. and Chicago public access. And then from one conversation to another, I had made the decision, you know what? I'm going to move to Los Angeles because I wanted to pursue sitcom writing. Got to Los Angeles. One thing after another, folks were like, have you thought of being an agent? So while temping at DirecTV and other places, I started the Rain Agency, where I was franchised with all of the entertainment guilds, SAG, after you name it. And I yeah. pulled my way through Hollywood. I picked up a book called Hollywood, I think it was uh, 411, and I started mm -hmm. calling. And that's how that business started. And so after four and a half years, I was tired and exhausted and a writer strike was coming. And so I thought, you know, it would be a good time to move back to the East Coast where I wanted to be near New York, love New York, but didn't want to live back in New York and also near Ohio, uh, where my mm -hmm. mom was and never been. Oh, well, no, I take it back. I came to Virginia once that took me to Washington. Yeah, uh, I moved to Alexandria, Virginia. And then I got my first job selling uh, professional employer organizational services to IT companies in the DC area. Cold mm -hmm. call my way through. Mm -hmm. And then I got another job working for a government contractor um, on a tech project plus business development. And mm -hmm. then I started looking some more, sold for another tech company as a contractor. And then that took me to um, actually my first software company um, where I got hired for the international world. And I said, to find out how I can get to anybody on earth, you have to hire me. And they yeah. hired me. And I cold called and I got some really good opportunities, key opportunities. And I was there for a while and then we got acquired and then I wanted to move on. And that took me to another company where I started the business development program for them. And that's, yeah. that, that's, the, that's the Reader's Digest version of how I went from point A to point B. <laughs> that is amazing. I am uh, dumbstruck to say the least. Your journey is uh, inspiring and it, it is truly, truly amazing for anybody that wants to read. I know uh, you have a book, so but it's about the BDR world where we can talk about that a little later if you want to share some of that. But one thing that comes to me from everything that you have described is the tenacity. And that's what you have always carried with you. It sounds glamorous to say I've been in theater in New York and I've done opera in Italy and I've been in Hollywood. And all, but the work behind it requires so much tenacity and strength and your podcast on Tuesdays. So tell us about the podcast, but also there's a line which stuck with me all uh, every time I um, hear it. I mean, you intend for it to stick with the audience, I'm sure, which is tenacity always wins. So what does that mean to you in the realm of the BDR? And why is that important to you? Because... I learned, first of all, I learned at a very, very early stage, yeah. nothing is going to be given to me. Yeah. If I wanted it, I had to go after it. Yep. Nothing was a gimme. So the tenacity came from that, mm -hmm. is that I have to go after it. And everything I shared, although like I can make it look, you know, nice and fluffy. Yeah. It took a lot of grit. It took a lot of, uh, a lot of people saying no to me. And yeah. me figuring out how to turn that no around, but to keep, yeah. keep going. Yeah. Um, I did the apprenticeship in Italy, the opera apprenticeship. It was through a university program. Yeah. They did, to be honest with you, my audition tape was not that great. 
But I kept after the director of that program and said, I want to go. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I called him, uh, how many times till he finally took me and accepted me. And he told me in Italy, your audition tape was not that great. Mm -hmm. But it was your tenacity that said, I'm going to take a chance and accept her in this program. And he said he's glad he did. Well, at that time, he was glad that he did. Yeah. So you have, if you want something in life, you have to go after it. And in the BDR world, unfortunately, that role is so misunderstood of what it is that people don't understand that BDRs are the most, have to be the most tenacious people. They have to be the go-getters. They have to be the one, whether they're doing outbound cold calling, whether they're following up on a marketing lead, here's an example of why Mm -hmm. tenacity in the sales world and that BDR world is so important. At one of the companies I worked at, I had an inbound lead that came in. Inbound meaning that this was a C-level person that attended a webinar. Yeah. Major, major organization. I went after him and I went after him and he, he, I connected with him on the phone, but he's like, you know what? We're holding off. Then we connected via email, but there were things he told me and what I heard from him that said what my company offered, you guys need it. But I kept going after months. My records in Salesforce, I document everything for as long as it can get. And finally, after months, even I gave up at the very end, I'm going to be honest. And I thought, Mm -hmm. okay, this is not going to happen. As soon as that happened, I walked into my office the next morning, listened to my voicemail messages when messages were being left and they wanted a demo. And that (laughs) demo went to the next meeting and they turned into a customer. But my tenacity to continue to pursue and to relentless is when they were like, okay, let's do it. So that is needed in the BDR world. My best BDRs, what I looked for when I hired them was, could they be tenacious? Did they show experience, whatever that experience was, where tenacity would be needed? And they were the best hires and they eventually moved on to be the best salespeople and executives and so forth. That's that is so on point, um, and you articulated uh, very truly. You require tenacity in the role today, whether it is the BDR yeah. role, whether it is the business. Any role in business requires tenacity today, and in customer success, we have a similar attitude. We need to be tenacious. We need to go after and reach out to the customers when they don't have the time of day for us because they have a business to run. So we have to be available when they are available. But we also look for that emotional quotient. When I look for a good CSM, yes, the skill set is fantastic, but I look for empathy. So how does tenacity and empathy, how does that balance? Um, Just simply being tenacious can probably make you a cold hard person if you let it, but <laughs> but the key yeah. is not to let it. So how do you balance the two? And how do, and uh, so let me preface that by saying that the BDR role you often get people that are out of college hires or interns early in career professionals, and now you are teaching them two of the most coveted skills in the industry: tenacity. And empathy. <laughs> well, you, you have to have empathy. You you have to care. You have to care, basically. And that right. comes across to your customers, to potential customers, to your new hires. With yeah. the BDR team, look, where did the empathy come from? I knew what it was like back then. Yeah. I knew what poor managers were like and yeah. had lack of patience and not yeah. coach and not teaching and not being honest is like to a 20 some year old. I know yeah. what it's like. Yeah. So with that in mind, the empathy towards new hires, um, especially around that age bracket, especially around coming right out of college, it's already there. Yeah. I don't, you don't forget what your experiences were like. Yeah. Um, guess what? It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop yeah. even when you're, 
but you can be able to pass that empathy. It just becomes natural. And when yeah. your team understands that you understand where they're coming from, they will respond to you. They will respect you because you get it. You know, yeah. outbound cold calling is not easy. It's not easy. Yeah. I love doing it. I've been doing it, like I said, since I was 11 years old. It's yeah. not easy. So, but it is regardless in our new tech world and new tech AI age and what have you, it is still a foundational skill that will still open doors and provide opportunities. Folks, regardless yeah. of what you read on LinkedIn or any articles, it is still a necessity. So yeah. having gone through it, having to still continue to do it, I understand what that BDR, what that young professional is going through. And because of that, I provide that empathy and can be able to coach them effectively and yeah. still give them the push where you need to be tenacious. You know, people are always afraid that you're going to bother people on a call. Yeah. Yeah. You're not bothering anyone because yeah. when you connect with them, it's not what I always told BDRs. It's not just what you say. It's how you say it and how yeah. you say it will naturally show your empathy to the person yeah. that you're trying to connect with. So yeah. those are some examples of how to be able to mesh tenacity and empathy together. Very nice. And you also mentioned that your um, BDRs, they went from being the tenacious ones, went from being great BDRs to great salespeople. And I'm sure you're still in touch with a few. Uh, you have yeah. success stories, I'm sure, of people that have um, struck, uh, that, that have stuck with it, have stuck through the hard times and sort of shown where they can take, where, where, they, where the good, where the tenacity can take them. <laughs> Um, Absolutely. Um, it, it, it's very um, enlightening. Uh, and it's kind of like a proud moment, even though, you know, they're yeah. they're doing it. When I see it, uh, again, we go back to LinkedIn, where they yeah. have advanced in the ranks at such really young ages, VPs yeah. of skills, uh, senior directors. Um, yeah. They are doing it. And a lot of times I'll connect with them and congratulate. And I'll get a lot of feedback saying, you know what? We learned a lot of those skills that helped us, Lorraine, from our BDR days. Yeah. Um, I even have a young lady uh, from a, a past client who was one of my BDRs. She's not in sales today. She's in a completely different field. But the foundation, she said, to get to where she is came from her BDR days. I had one uh, BDR who is now an actor and doing quite well. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of independent work, uh, film, television. And I've seen him on uh, national commercials uh, yeah. in the morning as well, too. And that tenacity is needed if you're going to pursue, especially the entertainment world. But that conversation yeah. to go and to want to go into acting started back in my office where he yeah. came in and wanted to get some advice because he wanted to pursue it. And it's so yeah. wonderful. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's him when I look at the commercial or I see, you know, independent awards. Um, and that requires tenacity. And that came back from being the good old tenacious BDR day. So a lot of, I'm kind of hiding their names, but just kind of yeah. a lot of great stories um, came from BDRs who were tenacious. They understood the need for it, were empathetic. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a BDR once um, where he connected with a VP, I forget the exact title, and that VP at the time was not looking to buy the product that this company was providing, but there was mm -hmm. something that this BDR said to him that made him want to take the meeting that wanted to see the demo. And they ended up becoming a customer, by the way. But that yeah. VP, that prospect wanted me to know that it was the tenacity combined yeah. with the empathy that came across that yeah. made him want to learn more. And like I said, they became a customer in a very short period of time and they were not even looking. Yeah. So do you have customers then that remember the BDRs by name? Is there a chance um, for the BDRs to interact with the customers after? Who are the BDRs customers? Uh, I'm guessing there are folks internally that the BDRs always work with. So share some of that with our audience, please. <laughs> Yeah, so if you're looking at the BDR customer internally, the BDR mm -hmm. customer is both the sales 
teams, mm -hmm. sales department rather, and the marketing mm -hmm. department. And as many know, from a reporting yeah. perspective, they typically fall under one or the other, sales yeah. or marketing, more than likely sales. But it, yeah. but that, that's not a good idea. I'm going to be honest. Yeah. That is not a good idea. There's a lot of tug of war, a lot of push and yeah. pull, a lot yeah. of this and that, and it makes it into a very difficult environment, not a toxic environment. The BDR team, the SDR team, should be their own department. And whoever is running it should report to the CEO, not the CRO, not the CMO. They yeah. should be their own department where they can effectively do their work and deliver to the company as a whole, not yeah. one team or the other where it becomes a tug of war. And it really, BDRs get caught in the cross, you know, they get caught in the middle and it just doesn't work that way. This is their own function, their own department. Now the marketing, it was interesting to me. So how does marketing feed into the BDR world? Is it the uh, the marketing uh, USP, so to speak? Or, what, or is it from for the lead generation side of things? Where, how does marketing play uh, with the BDR role? So a marketing departments, so many if not all, have lead gen departments, which I disagree with, by the way, too. I totally disagree yeah. with. But that being said, they do have lead gen departments. So with that, their hard work, they're effectively doing webinars, events, whatever the campaign is, what have you. And they need people to follow up on those people that went to the webinar to, you know. Yeah. So that is what, where marketing comes in and why they have an invested concern of getting those leads followed up and need BDR teams to effectively follow up. Now, yeah. here's the here, here's the issue. A lot of times the BDRs are not given the correct direction on how to follow up. Yeah. There is a process behind that. And not every person that went to your webinar should be followed up. Here's that's the other thing, where there mm -hmm. is a mindset that every person that came to what have you should be followed up on. And that's not necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. And many times it's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. You know, marketing departments generate a lot of content, which is great. White mm -hmm. papers, mm -hmm. books, that was the thing. And mm -hmm. their thing is they should be followed up on. And again, with results, because marketing departments are held accountable to conversion yeah. rates from those yeah. activities. And they need the BDRs to do them. Yeah. But the thing is, there is a mindset just because you downloaded a white paper doesn't mean that you actually remembered you downloaded it and it's going to be a yeah. hot conversation. In many ways, it's an outbound cold call process. Right. Uh, so that is where the marketing becomes very involved in the BDR role. Yeah. In Similarly, customer success also um, takes, I, I would like to say, I don't want to say takes direction, but I've said for the longest time that customer success has a pulse on the sentiment of the customer and yep. you need a direct line of communication to the top where it matters. If somebody wants to know what your customers are actually saying about you, you need a line of communication right at the top versus yep. going through a different department or a different group with a different directive. Now. It may not always work that easily, and there's different business um, motivations to keep the keep the group under a different department. But all in all, the line of communication needs to be open where the sentiment is brought forward. Um, yeah. What's next for you, Lorraine? What are you What are you thinking of? uh for 2024 i mean in the world of ai in the world of um so many different tools that can actually do your outbound uh, outbound calls right you you can have um you can have a bot doing your cold calling so why not invest in that? It's far more cheaper than uh, than having an uh, an operational person in place so where do your thoughts lie there? Well, why not just go with AI versus invest in a BDR team? Because 
People want to talk to people. Yeah. That's the key thing. I mean, even in the customer customer world, I mean, think of the number of times where you as a customer have had to want to call, you know, you've Mm -hmm. got an issue with your bank or whatever, and they keep rerouting you, or you keep getting this bot on the phone or whatever. It is the most frustrating experience. So from a sales, from an outbound cold calling perspective, I don't want to talk to an artificial person. I want to talk to a real, I want a real person. Because here's the other thing too. The big thing, tenacity gives you and empathy gives you listening abilities, listening skills. That's where people connect. Do you hear me? Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. A artificial can't do that. You can't, an artificial cannot have that real life list conversation where you're listening and responding. They, it's not real. People want to talk to real people, not something artificial. I'm sure artificial intelligence has its place, but not where it comes. Even in the year 3000 and whatever, people yeah. want to talk to people. Yeah. So that's my two cents. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You're, <laughs> not, you're, you're right. But AI is here to stay, right? Right. Yeah. So how can we then leverage the benefits that AI brings forward and have some of our people propel the motivations that drive the team? How can we propel those forward uh, using the benefits that AI brings to the table? I think that is the question that we have to leverage, right? (laughs) Right, exactly. But the question, the whole thing, answer a question with a question. Yeah. Do we really know yet what AI will benefit? Now, I will say this. I I, I do like chat GPT. Yeah. Uh, it helps polishes my words and writing. So there is some val- there is value with that. I'm not yeah. a fan of email, email yeah. writing, but if there needs to be some level of email communication, like somebody responded to a BDR and they do need to respond via email it polishes their work. Doesn't take away your thoughts. It polishes the work. So there is value with that. But otherwise, yeah. otherwise, I don't really, I think we still have a lot to learn. At yeah. the same time, people have been using chat bots. Yeah. And, that's, and everyone's like, oh, we got to use a chat bot. How is a chat bot going to go? Well, I can't tell you. The other week, I wanted to see a demo of a product for SDRs. And I responded to the chat bot, whatever. I'm still waiting for the chat bot to get back to me. How's that for an answer? Yeah. How's that? And that's been going on for years as well, too. As soon as they started to come out, oh, yeah. the chat bots and whatever, they still don't know. And in the meantime, yeah. you're losing money. You're losing potential customers. So what I'm hearing you say is let folks figure it out first. In the meantime, business has to proceed and you need a person to do it. And that person has to do it with tenacity, the cold calling, all of that, and showing some empathy uh, in understanding the customer's mindset. That's where the current state of affairs is today. So this is this is amazing. This is awesome. I have a comment here from uh, Vivek. So our audience today is from Asia, in India, Asia, as well as here on the East Coast and then West Coast as well, Lorraine. So um, (laughs) Vivek actually heads up Thinkly, and uh, I can't tell you how amazing the Thinkly team has been in making all of this possible. So uh, Vivek says the BDR has to be the most critical function in an organization because nothing really happens unless someone sell something. So for somebody to be able to sell something, the BDR has to do something. So any thoughts right. on that? <laughs> Absolutely. But but what I always say to you, you said a key word, sell. Mm-hmm. And this is where companies don't have a little bit of confusion of what the BDR role is. And I always have yeah. to tell clients, well, let's take a step back. They're not selling your product, but yeah. they're selling is the opportunity for their company to speak with you. The selling part should be happening with your account executive, your sales team. These guys are the ones that are selling the company. They're the first voice. So 
That is very important. That is very important to be able to distinguish what they are quote unquote selling. But yeah, they are they're they're the first ones in line. This is awesome. Uh, we are at 10 a.m. here on the East Coast. So just about time for you to give us one lasting comment. Tell us about your uh, podcast and then anything, any lasting uh, parting comments that you want to share. Sure. No, thank you. So uh, my podcast is Tuesday at 10 a.m. with Lorraine. Where did that name come from, Tuesday at 10 a.m.? When I would always role play with BDRs and we would close for the call, it would be, how does Tuesday at 10 a.m. work? I don't know where that date and time came from, but that, so I thought, what a great way to rename the podcast. So basically the podcast, I've had it for years. I used to interview a lot of folks in the industry to get their viewpoint on what they thought outbound was. And this year I actually changed the structure to make it more of impromptu. So a Tuesday morning, I don't even plan for it. It's whatever co topic comes to my mind to have an impromptu raw discussion um, around, you know, outbound, around sales, around hiring, around any, all of this stuff that we're going in, uh, going through today. Um, so that's, and I try to keep it short, but sometimes I might ramble a little bit, but that's what the podcast is about. And I try to do it every Tuesday morning, um, to kind of keep the consistency. That's fantastic. And I couldn't agree with you more about the rambling because I ramble and I will say <laughs> rambling is therapeutic and it is fantastic. Yes, is yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Oh, I have another person um, with a comment. Desmond says, Lorraine, your journey is so inspiring. So thank you for talking to us today, oh, Lorraine. You're welcome. Is amazing. Your journey is truly, truly inspiring. I couldn't agree with you more. I think when you and I uh, chatted earlier, we were saying, you know, people have not been hungry and yep. they don't understand today the generation today needs to understand the driving force, but you don't have to learn about it the hard way. You can understand from other people's uh, experiences, but having that understanding that hunger is a real thing and yes. need is a real thing. The basic necessities are a real thing. That drive tenacity and that also makes you empathetic towards one another. And I think that leads to success in life. But um, any lasting thoughts for us, Lorraine? Well, uh, on my lasting thought to what you had just said, Rajuta, you know, like I told you in a prior conversation, there was an article on LinkedIn around people who post open to work, wear that banner on their profile yeah. picture. And some folks saying it might look like you're desperate. Yeah. No, no, that's called tenacity. That's called yeah. hunger. You put yeah. that over the work banner on your profile picture if you want to. And for those who are criticizing and any, making a, any negative comments, shame on you. That shows lack of empathy and that shows yeah. lack of any form of tenacity whatsoever. My final so thoughts. True. <laughs> <laughs> and you heard it, folks. Thank you, Lorraine. With that, Thank you. we come to the end of our uh live ama session today thank you so much katrina you're very welcome very thank you for having me learn, learn about your challenges and hopefully you'll join me once again lorraine on one of these um shows in the future so hope so thank you so much thank you everyone bye bye, -bye.